Hey, I'm back, and it's Saturday, so you know what that means. A little wrong, back to bookish, and welcome back to my Saturday hodgepodge, my weekly wrap up of all things booktube, bookish, anything else I want to talk about. Uh, I want to start off today just really quickly explaining where I've been in case you didn't see the community posts. Um, you know, I had kind of a rough two weeks uh, health wise. I had oral surgery two weeks ago to remove a broken wisdom tooth, uh, and that went fine. Uh, and then about a week later, uh, beginning on Tuesday of last week, uh, I started experiencing some gastrointestinal pain, which I thought was complications from uh, pain medication, and uh, so I just went on. On Wednesday, I drove uh, two and a half hours to see my mom. I felt fine Wednesday, but I woke up Thursday morning feeling really bad. Decided to cut my trip to see my mom short, came home early, drove the two and a half hours back here, by the time I got back here, I was pretty uh, uncomfortable, pretty uh, in, in a pretty good amount of pain. But I laid down, seemed to go away, and then at one point I realized this is you know really bad. I have to go to the hospital, and so we did. Uh, by the time I got there, uh, most of the pain that I had been experiencing uh, seemed to have gone. I didn't think it was anything serious. I wanted to leave uh, the emergency room. My wife convinced me to stay uh, and to go ahead and at least. Uh, see what they had to say. They did a CAT scan, discovered my uh, appendix was really infected and swollen and inflamed and scheduled me for uh, emergency surgery, which I had, you know, around four o'clock in the morning uh, on Friday. Uh, and then uh, I was able, I spent a night, an extra night in the hospital uh, because the infection was so bad to make sure to monitor my blood work. And then I was able to come home on Saturday. Uh, so I've been home since Saturday, uh, recovering from uh, that surgery uh, and so uh, I've been doing a lot of reading, well some reading, I've been watching a lot of booktube and I just want to again say, and I said this in my last video, thank you for, to everybody for the well wishes and uh, wishes for a speedy recovery and thoughts and prayers and all those kinds of great things. So I thought I'd start off just by explaining that little uh, bit of information and then I go right into talking about uh, my reading wrap up. Now ordinarily I, I think this will probably serve as more or less a wrap up for uh, uh, for the month of July, with the exception of one book, which I am probably still going to be reading when July comes to an end. Uh, so I just want to do some a real quick wrap up, see kind of where we stand. First of all, uh, I do usually listen to audiobooks when I go on trips, when I drive to see my mom, and I did listen to another Edith Wharton uh, novel and complete that in the month of July, and that was The Custom of the Country which is not my favorite Edith Wharton uh, novel, in part because I found the main character of Undine to be so incredibly unlikable uh, that uh, I, I found myself wishing that only bad things would happen to her uh, and being a little disappointed in the way in which things worked out, but as is true with all, all these Edith Wharton, there is brilliant characterization, an incredible subtlety in the way in which people uh, and their behaviors uh, and their actions are described uh, that made parts of it just absolutely delightful. I think that would be my fifth uh, Edith Wharton novel uh, that I've completed uh, and uh, can't recommend Edith Wharton highly enough. Also this month before all the stuff started happening, I did uh, read and review Yellow Face by R.F. Quam. Uh, I'll probably leave a link to that review at the end of, end of this video. I will say that I liked it since having read it. I've seen several reviews that point things out that I had missed, uh, which probably make me question it as a novel. You know, is is the writing great? Is the plotting good? I had some questions about those things myself, and maybe question those things about it, and question the message, um, and you know, to a certain extent, question what R. F. Wong is actually up to here uh, in the book. But I, I still have to tell you, I found it a compelling, interesting, uh, propulsive read. Its cringiness, uh, intentional. Um, and and cringiness in a way which really uh, made me want to keep reading and at the same time somehow bizarrely you know uh, wanting the main character perhaps to get away with what she was doing which was completely wrong uh, simply for the sake of uh, you know not creating a bigger problem I guess which may you know make me wrong in my thinking but I did read it I did I did like it quite a bit uh, also I am still reading uh, Tomb of Sand by Keaton Jolly Shree uh, which you know is going really slow for me and this is partially the subject of the video I made uh, on Wednesday about DNFing and the dangers I see in DNFing which I want to readdress here just in a minute but I am still reading that and hopefully we'll finish that in August which is appropriate because August is Women in Translation Month um, 
Um, I also read three nonfiction books this month, which is really one of my goals uh, in July, was to read a little bit more nonfiction. Felt like I'd kind of fall into a bit of a reading uh, slump or rut. Uh, and so I wanted to read some nonfiction. I did. I read, buddy read, Zora and Langston, uh, the story of, what does it say, Friendship and Betrayal. I buddy read this with Stephanie Cohen, uh, a regular here on BookTube, makes a lot of comments, does a lot of buddy read, and just a great, great buddy reader. And this tells the story of the end of the friendship between Zora and Langston. As you know, uh, I really enjoy um, looking at friendships between the authors and particularly how certain works sometimes interfere with that. There may be a video that comes out of this. But this was a really good, engaging work of history. There were some issues that I had with it, some things I thought the author did, which I would have avoided uh, doing, but I do think it gives some real good insight into both uh, of those writers and personalities and kind of the, the weird world of white patronage of uh, black authors uh, in, during the Harlem Renaissance, which I found to be really insightful. Uh, and then I read a book which really just blew me away for no reason that I can ex I can explain very well, and that is as we have always done, uh, Indigenous Freedom Through Radical Resistance by Leanne Betta Semisake Simpson, uh, who you may know uh, wrote one of my favorite books, or wrote my favorite book a couple years ago, which was Nupaming, uh, which I just found to be extraordinary and experimental and weird and wonderful and in some ways incomprehensible, and I fell right back into that um, kind of feeling and reading this book, even though this is a book of nonfiction, it is a manifesto for indigenous populations of people living in Canada at the very least, but elsewhere, uh, that suggests that the way to resist uh, the former, uh, the, the continued presence, the continued uh, negative influence of uh, colonial settler um, encroachments uh, on their rights, freedoms, lands, etc., is to remain and go back to uh, traditional ideas, traditional values, traditional practices and among those the most powerful among those she includes really is in lots of ways inclusion and so uh, there's a really powerful statement here now this is a book that she did not write for a white audience she you know I'm a descendant of colonial settlers she did not write this for me it is not a book written with my gaze or my opinion in mind and yet it completely you know really kind of sucked me in and made me want to keep reading made me want to understand you know through understanding the, the prescription she describes for resistance to understand the things that have been lost uh, and the way perhaps forward and maybe even though again not written for, for the point of view of allies, a way in which allyship may be uh, helpful. So I, I, I finished that and really liked it. And then just today, this morning, I finished uh, a book I've been meaning to read literally for decades and that is Everybody Was So Young, Gerald and Sarah Murphy, A Lost Generation Love Story. This is about the Murphys, Gerald and Sarah, uh, who were a married couple who pretty much knew everybody, uh, uh, who was a member of the Lost Generation, who uh, was famous, who were uh, kind of in some ways the it couple uh, within the arts and writing communities in the 1920s, who lived on the French uh, coast in the Mediterranean. They had a house there they referred to as the Villa, uh, Villa American. American or American, uh, in which they hosted, you know, everybody you can imagine, from John Dos Passos and his wife to Archibald McLeish and his wife, Cole Porter, F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway and his various wives and kids, Picasso, Fernand Leger, uh, just an incredibly, you know, involved uh, couple in that movement, and how in lots of ways uh, they supported those people and how their friendship worked out, also the relationship between the two people and their couple. Uh, they were obviously wealthy, but they weren't, you know, uh, the wealthiest people around during the time period, but they were obviously wealthy and could afford a lavish, uh, wealthy lifestyle and to support arts and artists. I, I found the book to be really good. Now, I would say, if you, I, what I would say, if you really like the lost generation, if you really like that modernist period uh, in American literature, or that modernist period in world cultural events, I think this is a really good book. But it is going to feel gossipy and name droppy at times because they did know a lot of people and working them in to the text occasionally becomes a little bit mind numbing with the people they knew and the things they got involved with. One of the things I did not know about uh, Gerald Murphy is that he was in fact an artist who really was only recognized uh, for the very few works of art he was able to co create and that were preserved uh, way late in his life. Uh, but. Uh, just just a really good, insightful kind of couple's biography of a group of two people who were really 
at the core of a lot of the things going on in the arts and the letters in the 1920s. So there you go, that's my wrap up. Uh, I'll probably have a video out, or make a video uh, next weekend, maybe for Saturday, with my uh, pile of possibilities or my TBR for August right now. I haven't really been able uh, to think through a lot of that stuff. So uh, I don't really have a TBR idea for you right now. Uh, on Wednesday, I made uh, a video uh, in which I talked about the dangers of DNFing. And I, I have a feeling that uh, that might have, you know, not made people angry, maybe just ruffled some feathers that it didn't intend to ruffle. So a couple of things about that. Let me just make sure I, I point out, I, I do not think any, there's anything wrong with DNFing a book. For whatever reason you want to, your time is yours. Uh, your approach to what you read is is yours and, and you can read or not read whatever you want to read and I still think you're great and I still think that you know uh, that you have uh, are, are a great reader I'm not intending in any of this discussion to suggest that there's anything inherently wrong with DNFing my only point was that I thought that we have to be and, and probably because I saw myself falling into DNFing more often is we have to be I think we should be a, perhaps a little bit more cautious about the process because I do think there's things that we can miss. I do think there are things that uh, can go by the wayside if we DNF too often. Part of my determination to read Tomb of Sand is to to see what others have seen in it because it's a well-regarded book. Uh, it is a book that uh, occasionally I found to be incredibly beautiful and moving and the writing to be great and for that reason alone I want to go on even though it's not a book that I find myself engaged with or enjoying uh, much of the time, but you know, I do want to get through it uh, for for that reason. But I don't want to give the impression that I I was negative on DNF. Just you know, perhaps exercising a little more caution myself, and maybe to get others to think about being maybe a little bit more cautious about DNFing. That was the whole purpose. In the comment sections, which were great, which I always love comment sections on discussion videos. I have a great time uh, exchanging thoughts and ideas with people there. In the comment section, one of the things I several things were brought up to me. One. Uh, was that, you know, how did audiobooks play into my DNFing? And I have to be honest with you, I DNF audiobooks, you know, really at the drop of a hat. Uh, if that audiobook or that book isn't working, as is true in my kind of attempt to get through a Russian novel at some point, you know, in the near future, uh, I, by the way, still failed on Brothers Karamazov and um, uh, Father and Sons by Turgenev. Um, <laughs> still failing there, but I DNF audiobooks at the drop of a hat. And I find that I DNF library books uh, much more readily than I DNF books that I own, which then really got me back to the truth of perhaps why I don't DNF. And that's just that I'm essentially cheap. <laughs> I don't want to not uh, consume all of the book that I paid money for. Uh, and I did, by the way, if you're wondering, I did buy a copy of Tomb of Sand. Uh, and so maybe that has a lot, a lot more to do with it. I do think also, though, that one of the things that, that is true about my reluctance to DNF is that kind of fear of missing out, that I'm going to miss something that would have been extraordinary, that would have come if I'd finished the book. I do think there's a certain element of that there as well. Anyway, I did just want to make sure I readdressed uh, that issue. I don't have any music to share with you, but one of the things that I also did in addition to listening and watching a lot of booktubes, I listened to a lot of podcasts, and I found a New Yorker fiction podcast in which they invite an author to come on the on their podcast and read a short story that's appeared in the um, in the New Yorker, and then to talk with the fiction editor of the New Yorker about that. Um, and the one I want to draw your attention to is just an unexpected treat for me. Uh, so much so that I listened to it twice, once under you know more anesthesia than once less. But George Saunders picked a story by Claire Keegan, the name of which I can't recall right now. But that story, he was supposed to be the one who read it. They were going to record him reading it, and then he would talk to the fiction editor about it. But that story contains the C word. I won't go any further than that. And Saunders felt uncomfortable uh, reading the C word out loud as it applied to uh, a woman in the story. And so they got Claire Keegan to actually read the story. So if you have loved... Foster, and if you've loved small things like these and other works by Claire Keegan, and you want to hear her read a short story for free, you can find that by going to New York New Yorker Fiction uh, podcast. I'll try to leave a link to it down below, uh, and you can hear her read the story, which uh, was really delightful. And 
I enjoyed hearing her read it uh, more than I actually enjoyed uh, Saunders and the author's discussion of it, but that was good too. Anyway, I'll try to leave, leave a link to that down below. I think that's it for this Saturday. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. As I always say, I look forward to your comments in the comment section below. And as always, thank you for watching.